I just wanted to remind you this week that you matter. You matter all very much to me. And we all matter to one another. And when some of us are hurting, some of us are missing, some of us are not feeling well, we miss you when you're not here. So I just want to let you know personally, coming from me, you all matter very much to me. And you matter very much to this church. And perhaps more importantly, and especially, you all matter very much to God. And the passage that I've used today to make that point comes from the book of John, chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Perhaps an odd text you might find to support the premise that you matter, but if you'll hear me out, I think you'll understand where I'm going. John chapter 2. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. You know, a host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you've kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed him. You know, in life, there's no do-overs when it comes to making first impressions, is there? And our first impression of Jesus' glory, as we've read now from John chapter 2, leaves some of us perhaps wondering whether he kind of missed the mark by not going big. I mean, you know, like raising the dead or vacating an entire cemetery if he wanted to really reveal his glory. Because first impressions are crucial, and things matter. And this was Jesus' first miracle. It was supposed to be this harbinger of things to come. And changing water into wine, although miraculous, you know, it kind of comes across as just a nifty chemistry experiment. Right? And the plot of the story is almost too simple. Jesus and his disciples are at a wedding. The host runs out of wine. All the stores are closed, so Jesus, at his mother's encouragement, transforms six jugs of water into wine. That's it. That is the lead off hit. That is Jesus' first revealing his glory. And in a sense, it seems awfully low-key. I mean, it certainly doesn't have the punch of calling someone back from the dead, right? Or maybe the flair of straightening a crippled leg? Or maybe does it? I mean, it was the equivalent of producing 600 to 900 bottles of wine. I mean, it was a veritable boutique winery. But the content and the quantity of the miracle here, I don't think, is really the key. So maybe there's more to this miracle than first meets the eye. Because you see, in the days of Jesus, uh, a wedding was no small event at all. It usually began 
with a Wednesday sundown ceremony at the synagogue. And people would then leave the church and begin this long procession through the town, usually by candlelight, to wind their way through the city, through this soft evening sunlight, so that everybody could see. The couple was now escorted past as many homes as possible so that everyone could wish them well in their nuptials. But after the processional, the couple did not go on a honeymoon. The honeymoon came to them. The new couple essentially would come home to a huge party. And for several days, there would be gift giving, there would be speech making, there would be food eating, and yes, there would be wine drinking. Because in that culture and in that time, food and wine were taken extremely seriously. The host would honor the guests by keeping the plates full and the cups overflowing. It was, in fact, considered an insult to the guests if the host would ever run out of food or wine. In fact, hospitality during that period of time was an extremely sacred duty. All were to expected to adhere to those customs, and in fact, it was so serious, these customs that we're talking about, that if they were not properly observed, the host could get sued, literally. So it's no surprise then that they would take these matters with extreme importance and care. In fact, there was a saying among the rabbis at the time that said, without wine, there is no joy. So wine during this period of time was crucial. Not for drunkenness sake, because that was considered a huge disgrace. But wine was important for what it demonstrated. Because what it meant was the presence of wine acknowledged that this event, this day was special. And that all of the guests who had been included to be part of that event were equally special guests. The absence of wine then was a social embarrassment, and you would do anything you could to avoid that. Now, it just so happens that Mary, Jesus' mother, is one of the first people, apparently, to notice that the wine has run out. So she goes to her son and points out the problem, like a good Jewish mother. Because later on in the passage, Jesus gives his response, and she says to the servants, just do what he says. It's like she didn't really hear him. So she goes to her son and she says, look, they have no more wine. And Jesus' response was, dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. John chapter 2, verse 4. And it's almost as though Mary is saying, son, they're out of wine, and we really need to do something about this. And Jesus' response is, what do you mean by we, Mom? It's kind of like the time when the Lone Ranger and Tonto were surrounded by an entire Indian tribe. And so turning to his Indian companion, the Lone Ranger says, Tonto, I think we're in trouble. And Tonto looks back at the Lone Ranger and responds, What do you mean by we, Kimosabi? So apparently now was not the time for Jesus' first miracle. He told his mother straight out, Now is not the time. And interestingly, Jesus is very conscious of time. He created it, so he must be conscious about it. And he spoke about time a lot throughout his ministry. For instance, John chapter 7, verse 6, the right time for me has not yet come. John chapter 12, verse 23, the time has come for the Son of Man to receive his glory. Matthew chapter 26, verse 18, the chosen time is near. Mark chapter 14, verse 41, 
The time has come for the Son of Man to be handed over to sinful people. And John chapter 17, verse 1, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. And these phrases seem to imply that Jesus had a schedule, a certain order and time for specified events in his life. In other words, the mission of Christ had been carefully thought out and planned from the beginning of time. So he had a time and he had a place for his first miracle. And according to Jesus, in talking to his mom in John chapter 2, verse 4, this wasn't the time because the time wasn't right. You see, Jesus knew the plan And this was neither the time nor the place for implementing his plan. And it appears, at least at the beginning, that he's going to stick with the plan. But as he hears his mother and looks into the faces of the wedding party and the guests, he reconsiders. Because the significance of the plan is slowly eclipsed by the concern for the people. Timing is important, but people even more so. So Jesus changes his plan to meet the needs of his friends. Heaven's schedule is altered so some friends won't be embarrassed. The inaugural miracle is motivated not by some tragedy, not by some moral collapse, but the inaugural miracle of Jesus' ministry is motivated out of concern for some friends who are in a bind. And those of us who are concerned with making really good first impressions are left reading this story just a little bewildered. I mean, maybe even slightly bothered, because everything about this event seems wrong. I mean, it's the wrong time, it's the wrong place, it's the wrong people, it's the wrong miracle, it's the wrong crowd. We want Jesus to stick to his schedule, because this isn't the way it had been planned. But then again, church, If you've ever been embarrassed before in your life, then this story makes you a little happy. Because this miracle tells you that what matters to you matters to God. Now, we may think that's true, kind of in the broad sense, when it comes to like the big stuff, right? I mean, we think that God cares about us and that we matter when it comes to like major league stuff, like death, or disease, or sin, or maybe even a disaster. We know, at least philosophically, perhaps, we know esoterically, perhaps, we know, at least in our heads, it seems like we know that God cares. But what about the small thing? What about the grouchy bosses? What about flat tires? What about lost dogs? What about broken dishes and late flights and toothaches and a crashed hard drive? Do these things matter to God? Because we know that God's got a universe to run, right? He's got to keep the planet's in balance. He's got wars with which to deal, and he's got famines to fix. So who am I, in the grand scheme of things, to tell God about my ingrown toenail? Fortunately for you and for me, our Father, God, has already answered that question. The question being, Who am I to tell God about all my little small stuff? Because in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it says that you are an heir of God. 
and a co-heir with Jesus. In Luke chapter 20, verse 36, it says, you're eternal, like an angel. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, you're a holy priest. And in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, it says that you, church, are a treasured possession. In fact, Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, said, you were chosen before the creation of the world. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 19, it says, you are destined for praise, fame, and honor, and you will be a holy people to your God. But church, more than any title and more than any position, more significant than any of those things is the simple fact that you are God's child. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. The Father has loved us so much that we are called children of God. And we really are His children. I kind of like that last phrase. We really are his children. You see, John, in writing this, said, the Father has loved us so much that we are called, his, called children of God, period. And he could have ended it there. But he didn't. He added another sentence. And we really are his children. And I like that. It's as if John knew that some of us would probably be shaking our heads and saying, nah, not me. Mother Teresa, maybe. Billy Graham, probably. But me? No, not so much. And if those are your feelings, then John, through inspiration, added that phrase just for you. We really are his children. In other words, if something's important to you, it is important to God. And if you're a parent, you already know that. I mean, imagine if you noticed an infected sore on the hand of your five-year-old. You ask him what's wrong, and in his own little five-year-old way, explains to you that it's a splinter. So you ask him when it happened, and he tells you it happened last week. So you ask him why he didn't tell you sooner. And in his little kindergarten voice, he said, I didn't want to bother you. I knew you had all these things to do, and you had your job and work around the house, and I didn't want to get in your way. And you as a parent are saying, get in my way, are you kidding me? I'm your dad. And you're my child. My job is to help you. Because I hurt when you hurt. And similarly, church, because you are God's child. If it's important to you, it is important to God. So why did Jesus change the water to wine? For his first inaugural miracle. Was it to impress the crowd? No. They didn't even know he did it. Well, was it to get the wedding's master of ceremonies attention? No. He thought the groom was just being generous. So, if that's true, why does Jesus use as his first miracle the changing of water to wine for a wedding? What motivated his first miracle? It's because his friends were at risk of being embarrassed and what bothered them bothered him. If it hurts the child, it hurts the father. So this week, church, tell God what hurts. Would you? Talk to him. He's not going to turn you away. He won't think that whatever you're asking is silly because we know in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, it says, For our high priest, 
referring to Jesus, is able to understand our weaknesses. Why? The writer goes on to explain. When he lived on earth, he was tempted in every way that we are. But he did not sin. So let us then feel very sure that we can come before God's throne where there is grace. Does God care about the little things in our lives? The answer is absolutely, positively, yes. And the reason is, is because you matter. You worship a God that loved you so much that before the beginning of time, He knew that you were going to be created. He knew the experiences that you were going to go through. He knew that you would need a Savior because you're a sinner just like me. And he also knew that living with God as being part of the triune God, there is no sin in that location. And the creation that he made has now separated themselves from God who wants the creation to live with him. Well, how do you get a creation that's been jacked up by sin, back to a place where they can live with God who is sinless? Well, the answer was pretty simple from God's perspective. He said the way to do that is to send a sacrifice to pay the price of your sin so you don't suffer the consequence of the sin that you made. And the person who did that is Jesus Christ. And he died for you and he died for me so that we might have that perfect relationship with him forever and eternity. But what's even more important is he gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for you and for me so that we could live life abundantly today. It's not like, Okay, I'm saved, so now I'm just going to have to deal with it until I'm dead, and then I'll be happy in eternity. No. He sacrificed his life to give you life, abundant life, to share with those whom you deal every day. And the thing is, is that we all have an opportunity to make that choice. There are people who are not here that are outside of this church that don't know anything about Jesus. And unless we go out and share it, like Richard was saying, like Kirk was saying, being eager about it, they're not going to know. And I've told you before, this church isn't a club. You know, you don't flash a membership and walk in, and if you don't have one, we have a bouncer who kicks you out. This is a hospital. We take people in who are hurting. And we're all at various places along that spectrum. But we worship a God who loves us unconditionally and only asks that we recognize him as our Savior, that we confess our sins, that we be baptized into his death and then likewise into his resurrection and live a life worthy of the calling to which we have all been called. Do we make mistakes? Yes but we have God's forgiveness when we do. The problem for the world is, if they don't hear that message and they die, there is no hope. I've told you this story before, and it's been a while, so I'll just repeat it one last time because I think it fits here. Just go with me. There's Satan and his minions. And so these... Minions are all trying to figure out what would be the best way to tell people that there's no God. And the first one says, I I've got it. This is genius. Just tell them there's no help. You're lost. There's no help. Have a nice life. And Satan looked at him and said, no, I don't think that quite gets it. We have an entire Bible that has been given to God's people that shows quite clearly there is plenty of help. So that's probably not going to do it. 
So the next one said, yeah, that's right. No hope. You can have all the help you want, but there's no hope for you because you're still helpless. So tell them there's help. Just tell them that the help that they want is really meaningless because there's no hope. It's just a big joke. It's just pretend. And they got to thinking about it and thought, well, that sounds interesting. That's a possibility. That's probably a little better than just saying there's no help. Tell them there's no hope. But I don't think that's going to do it. And then the third one said, I've got it. We can tell them there's all the help in the world. We can tell them there's all the hope in the world. Let's just tell them there's no hurry. No hurry. And there's plenty of people in this world that should be in a hurry, but they're not going to know it unless we tell them. And if you mean that much to God, then you know that the people that are not here, that don't worship with us, that don't worship a God, he loves them too. He didn't die for this club. He died for the entire world. And our responsibility as Christians in living out that faith is to mirror that faith with the people with whom we come into contact. And some of us are better at it than others. Some of us are more vocal than others. Some of us are more gifted than others. Steve in his class this morning was talking about the body of Christ and was referring to a passage in 1 Corinthians. And that passage was talking about the fact that not all of us are ears, not all of us are eyes, not all of us are noses. Some of us have different skills, different attributes. That doesn't make us any less important to the body. I mean, take your appendix, for instance. I'm not really sure what an appendix does. Apparently, you can have your appendix removed and still live. So I don't know if that's just like an excess body part or that's just a spare if you don't need it, but it's still apparently important because we're all born with one. And so likewise in the church, you all can't get up here and talk. I get that, but I can't do what you do. We've got people who prepare the Lord's Supper. We've got people who clean the carpets. We've got people who uh, take in and count the collection. We've got people who put together the bulletins, who put together the order of worship, who put together the schedule of who's going to pray. Everybody has a specific gift, and this church lacks when you don't use that gift as it's intended. And it's because you matter. There you go. Well, those are the two that he sent thus far. You just keep trying. So, church, would you just know this week that you matter a lot to God? That he cares deeply for you. That you're not bothering him with complaints of a hangnail, for instance. He cares for you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And then the challenge becomes, well, if you care about the people with whom you live and work with and see, will you love them enough to tell them that same message? And it may not be anything oratorical that you share with them. There's an expression that the loudest sermon anybody has ever heard is the example of your life. So live the life. Live the calling. Live the walk. And when you have an opportunity, encourage people. Encourage them to come here. Encourage them to open the Bible because they matter. And so we've picked a song to kind of emphasize this point. Randall's going to be leading us in that song. If you have any prayer requests, you can hand them up at this time. We'll pray over those, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's stand and let's sing it.